And it'll, it'll tip. The, uh, can I just answer that too? I think the difficulty in engaging you know, the reader, a reader's intention is that basically readers don't care about you. Um, because they, mm -hmm. care, they don't care about, I mean, no one, no stranger is really interested in your internal life, right? I mean, it's hard enough to get the people around you interested in your internal life. <laughs> They're always hung up on themselves. What's up with that? Um, so how, how their attention is insufficient. How do you, how do you get a reader? You, you need to pleasure the reader. And you do that through form. You do that through writing a poem in which the words are well chosen, in which there's shape to it, where there are signs of human intelligence. And in fact, I'll t to put it more bluntly, to get a reader interested in your poetry, you have, to pre you have to pretend something that's not true. You have to pretend, your poem has to express this. Your poem has to express the fact that you're more interested in poetry than you are in yourself, which you are not. <laughs> <laughs> but the, re the, reader yourself, com Bill. the reader comes to you with an interest in poetry, not with an interest in you, granted. So if, you, if your poem conveys your interest in poetry, then that will lock in with the reader's interest in poetry, and then the reader will be interested in some fishing trip you took with your uncle or whatever you want to write about. Another question right here. Hi, um, you talked about finding your voice and imitating other uh, poets and things like that. Did you stop doing that? At what point do you stop doing that? When do you know that you found your voice? Well, after you find your voice, you, you realize there's only one person to imitate, and that's yourself. Um, but you do it by combining different influences. I think the first part of it is you do slavish imitations, which are almost like travesties, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but gradually, you come under the right influences, picking and choosing and being selective. And then you, maybe your voice is the, is, a, is the combination of six or eight other voices that you have managed to blend in such a way that no one can recognize the sources. So you can take like intimacy from Whitman. You can learn the dash from Emily Dickinson. I mean, you can pick a little bit from every writer and you combine them. And this, and this, this allows you to be authentic. That's one of the paradoxes of the writing life that the way to originality is through imitation. You know, I'd also say that when you imitate, you can do parodies as well, which are sometimes very useful because then you understand how that, that particular poet uh, used the irony or, or something like that. Then I think that what happens too is that you become impatient with the imitation, you say, well, I want to go somewhere else. You know, I don't want to stay in the imitation. That's a little bit of your voice poking out, right? Saying, you know, oh, I can do it different than that. And so, you know, a musician will practice their scales and they will practice all sorts of things. Why people think that writers get struck by lightning and suddenly write the perfect poem in one fell swoop, I don't know. So, you know, this idea of doing imitations or writing sonnets until they come out of your ears uh, is part of your craft. Yeah. One more quick question. Yes. Um, how do you both? Oh. your microphone. How do you both teach play? Play. Mm -hmm. I have a thing called the wild card, which I give to my students. It can come at any time during the semester, you know. Uh, it can take, are all different, uh, and they involve very strange things like at the first sign of the moon tonight when it rises, go out into a field and look for something purple. And then they have to open envelopes, and, and then the next envelope will say, and now you must turn around and sit and write, you know, a haiku and uh, then go back inside. So I'm, I give them all the stuff that makes them so angry at me because <laughs> they're like, especially, you know, I'll tell someone, you know, put on your heels and go out in the field. What do you mean go out in the field with my heels on? Um, because I want them to feel how uncomfortable that is. But in the end, what happens is that they say, I don't even care what I write anymore because I have to open another envelope. And they just play. They just say, I'm just gonna let it out. 
those wild cards are so much fun to write, and uh, and in the end, many of the my students say it's the most fun they've ever had writing the poem. It's the idea of letting go of your ego, forgetting who you are, playing with that language, and seeing what comes out of it um, that touches you instead of trying to impose something on the language. Students will start to play once they get irreverent about poetry, once they stop taking it dead seriously. And the hope is that they'll stop taking themselves dead seriously. Because the dead seriousness, the earnestness often over, overwhelms play. So I would, I take uh, poems like, take like Byron's She Walks in Beauty Like the Night. And I just say, you know, substitute night for something. So she walks in beauty like a nutcracker or she walks in beauty like a tangerine. And then, you know, and then suddenly everything's up for grabs and you're into, uh, you're into imaginative play and that's the, what poetry really offers. Thank you, Billy Collins and Rita Dove.